Hi everybody, my name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. So, you know, here we are again. Again, we're here together. Again, we're here to celebrate joy, to celebrate love, to celebrate our connection. And, you know, so much of us, so much of each of our beings wants to celebrate love, wants to celebrate being on this planet and, and being as children of, of love, being as children of what we call God or being children of this planet Earth or however you would look at it. But to come together collaboratively and joyously and lovingly and, and cooperatively to share the extraordinary bounty on this planet and we have a sense that there's a new paradigm being formed, that the bridge between heaven and earth is really starting to, to hold our weight, is really starting to, to be built in a way that could carry us into these new paradigms, into this way of love, into the way of, of connectedness, away from the fear, away from the division, away from the separateness, away from that which prevents us from knowing the extraordinary gift we have in this human body. And how we can do that, how do we continue to remember, to remind ourselves of eternity? I mean, one of the videos we have tonight is this beautiful video from Shaoli Makara from Hawaii, which is called Remind Me of Eternity. And it's part of a video that she's done, and you'll see that part tonight, and I'll tell you who wrote it and who's singing it and all that. But again, it's like, how can we remind ourselves, and how can we vibrate that remembrance of eternity, that remembrance of the infinite, that remembrance of the true love that we want in this life? <clears throat> and that's what we as human beings, what we as bridging heaven and earth, come forth. We want to come forth. The call is out to come forth. Come forth into the recognition of this moment, of this love, of this connectedness. And the more we can build up the momentum of that recognition, of that vibration, the new world will be built. The new world based on love, based on cooperation, based on collaboration. And again, tonight's guest is someone who's dedicated to his life to that. Michael Brown is a spiritual teacher, he's a healer. And through the circumstances of his life with physical pain and physical disharmony, it, it made him seek out, travel the world seeking out a cure, a, a help, a, a harmonization of this of this physical condition. And it led him all over the world to different types of modalities, different types of techniques. And it led him into an awakening. It led him into a recognition of this moment, of this love, of this truth, of our connection, of the oneness. And he's written a new book, The Presence Process, which basically is that experience, that recognition, and how to come into that recognition. I mean, the subtext is a healing journey into present moment awareness. And isn't the place of our recognition the place of true love in this present moment, to be here now? And that's what Michael now is traveling the world to, to share with people. And we're honored that he's here with us today to have that vibration with us and with you. So again, as I mentioned, we have two beautiful videos. One is the Shaoli video, and one is a video of a great friend of Bridging, Bonnie Wren. And as most of you know, we, we're in the middle of this international art project where, as a vision, we got this idea as a healing thing for the planet, as an acupuncture for the planet, to you know, reach out to everybody and say, anybody who wants to produce a new original piece based on the theme Bridging Heaven and Earth, any size, any format, any anything and we'll put it on the shows and we'll have art art openings in various places and we'll have virtual galleries and we will have this art this inspirational art based on the theme bridging heaven and earth 
vibrating throughout the world. And two pieces tonight are by uh, Galen Larrick and uh, Lauren Curtis, two amazing pieces, two different pieces, all based on the theme Bridging Heaven and Earth. So it's an opportunity tonight, just two beautiful videos, two beautiful pieces of art. Michael with us, so settle in, join us. So we're going to have a short meditation, and then we'll have the first video. So join me in a short meditation. Thank you. So the first video tonight, as I mentioned a little while ago, was Remind Me of Eternity. It was produced by Shaoli Makara, and uh, it was sung, the words and music, by Kathy Zavada, uh, and it was, you know, shot in Hawaii. It's with the dolphins, and uh, it was shot by Matisha. And it's an amazing piece, Remind Me of Eternity, Shaoli Makara, Kathy, and Matisha. Here it comes, enjoy. Remind me to 
welcome back. So thank you, Shaoli. Thank you, Matisha. And thank you, Kathy, for that reminding me of eternity. And the incredible picture you're seeing in between Michael and I now is Elemental Alchemy by Galen Larrick. Again, there's just an incredible story behind this piece. This will be on the art project show we do, the next art project show we do. And it's just pieces are coming in from all over the world, just extraordinary manifestations of love. So we're here with Michael. Welcome. Thank you. So, we were talking a little earlier about like healing the heart, or I use that word, use another word. Why don't you talk a little bit about like that being the root of your method or your message? Or there's a story that I like to tell of um, a man walking along a street late one night, and he comes across an, another person on their hands and knees under a street light, um, looking for something. And so the person says, have you lost something? And he said, yes, I've lost my key. He said, can I help you find it? He says, sure. And it's just a small area of illumination. So after a minute or so, the man has looked over the whole area and he says, are you sure you've lost your, are you sure you lost it here? And he says, no, I lost it at home. So he says, well, why are you looking here? He says, because my lights don't work at home. That's right. So this is, uh, this, this story tells about how we are using the means of perception available to us to look for something that those means of perception don't have a capacity to perceive. The tool is too small. To... Yeah, the tool is too small and limited. And that's the reason we're using these available means of perception is because there is another perceptive, perceptual ability that has been shut off. And we're not even really aware that it's been shut off. And it's, it may not be that it's been shut off, it may just be that it's only now awakening. And um, that really is what my, my journey was about. My journey began with immense pain. It's, the pain is what it took to get my attention. But I was kind of bumbling along, I was in the music industry having a great time, uh, trying to live the rock and roll life long after you know that, that era had passed, and I was trying to make up. Oh my God! Oh my God! This guy's so I'm trying to right. you know enjoy you know do, do all that stuff that I wish I'd been alive in the 60s to do it, doing all that stuff. And out of the blue, I got smacked by this unbelievable, painful condition, which um, hit me about eight times a day, and. Uh, it, it really got my attention to the point that I, it stopped me in my tracks. You know, I, I lost my job, I, eventually my relationship fell apart. Everything fell apart and this thing took over. And so I began on a journey of trying to figure out what was happening to me. And of course I began my journey in a very physical way by going into the, the allopathic um, medical routes of trying pharmaceuticals and medications. And then I started to do the crazy things like going to witch doctors, which we call them sungormas, uh, having cortisone injections in my face, having my wisdom teeth removed, doing all the sorts of physical stuff. Um, and then I got to a point where I realized that um, no one could help me. And it was a point where either I was going to check in or check out uh, because of the nature of the pain. And at that point in my journey, I started to look at uh, self-healing but it was also the point that I went from the very physical part of my journey into the mental part of my journey trying to mentally understand my experience and studying a lot of what I thought of as spiritual things there but realizing I was on a very much a mental journey trying to understand the nature of my human experience and what was happening and then from that point I made a an entry into the emotional um, in which um, a tribal the thought creates the, the positive affirmations the all of that stuff and that didn't work either and it was only when i was made aware through the people who showed me that i was really an angry and it was very nice but i was very angry um, and that underlying my pain condition was an emotional signature um, which was fear anger and grief uh, for me a lot of anger and underneath that a lot of grief and only when I began to impact that aspect of my experience did the mental and physical aspect of my experience uh, start. Because that was much more the root of it. It was the root. So of you it. could deal with all the leaves, but as long as the root was right, still there. Right. Right. And 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 um, uh, so so this awoke me to what I call the heart or the feeling capacity, and in this respect, the 
the role the emotional body plays uh, in, our, in the quality of our experience. When we have a, if we have an, if we exit an experience and we feel good about it, then it was a good experience. We don't worry about what happened. It was a good. If we feel bad about it, then it was a bad experience because the, the feeling aspect of our experience is going to really determine the quality. And this I didn't realize until I began to work in my own emotional body. And so on my journey, I, I um, what really woke me up um, was the awareness that I wasn't here in this world, really. Although I was here physically and mentally, I really wasn't showing up. And uh, in our conversation earlier, I was explaining to you that at one point in my journey, in a very short space of time, I had three what I call present moment awareness experiences. One was facilitated by a sweat lodge, one was facilitated through a rebirthing breathwork experience, one was facilitated through taking peyote. But all three experiences led me into the same state of being, which I call being present. And in the state of being present, which is this moment, this endless moment, there was no pain. Um, and, and so it was a, a great revelation to me that what my pain was trying to show me was... Was driving you into the moment. Was trying to say, come, come, come here, right, come, come here, right? right? My, my physical body was saying, I'm going to use whatever I can to bring you into this moment because you are so in the mental, you're so, right? And, and so when I, once I realized that, my intent began to simply, my life intent was I want to show up in this life. And not only do I want to show up in this life, but I'd like to show up in a way that could be useful to other people. In other words, lead, I know that there's this present moment sta space, this paradigm, which is right here. It's not like we have to go anywhere to get to heaven. We just have to show up here. We already died. We just got to show up now, rest in right, peace, going, right? Right. All right? Rest time to RIP, rest in peace, right? right. And so this, this state of being is here, but why is it that I'm unable to enter it? What is it? that drags me out of it into this mental place which there's this massive amount of uh, physical discomfort. And through asking these questions and then entering experiences, I became aware of um, what I call the pathway of awareness. And the pathway of awareness is, is a pathway that our awareness moves along to enter what we call the human experience. And we can see this pathway very simply by watching a baby. When a baby is born, it first emotes. It's purely an emotional being. It then starts to use its emotions as a capacity to communicate, to try and manipulate its, ex its experience. It starts to enter more of a mental capacity. And then only can a baby reach out, deliberately grab something and hold on to it deliberately. So it doesn't come out doing physical things. It doesn't come out chatting, wow, it's weird in the womb. And, or it comes out emotional. And I noticed this, this pathway also in what I call the seven-year cycle. Um, the first seven years of our life, we're children. And as children, we're energy in motion. Any parent will tell you that their children are basically energy in motion. And it's an emotional period. After seven years, we, go in, we become institutionalized in, in which we go into a very uh, mentally fo focused aspect of our experience. And, and then for another seven years, we're reading, writing, communicating, very powerful mental development. And then around the age of 14, there's actually a, a physical shift in our being, which we call puberty. And then we become more focused upon the physical world. So this pathway is going from the emotional through the mental and into the physical. The only thing is, by the time we get into the physical, we have become physically transfixed by this world. We perceive this world as happening to us instead of through us. And what happens is we perceive the world happening to us, and then we mentally interpret it. We try to understand it, and then we act out of these mental interpretations. And what we don't realize, uh, and the word real eyes is related to the way that the heart sees. The heart has real eyes. The mental body has anal eyes. That's why we say I analyze this. And then the, f the physical body has physical eyes. By the time we're adults, we are using our physical eyes and our anal eyes and we're not using our insight, we're seeing everything outside. And that's because between the ages of 7 and 14, this part of our being, that story I told initially about the man searching for something because his lights aren't working at home, so he searches out in the street, there's a part of our being that, that shuts down between the ages of 7 and 14, which is our felt perception. Intuition, in a sense. Yes, uh, well, uh, intuition, uh, 
our insight, our ability to see within to the causal point of our experience. And, and so when this part of our being shuts down, we can't see the connection between the causal part of our experience, the first seven years of, of our childhood, and the impact that this is on, having ongoing to the quality of our adult experience. In our adult experience, we have these uh, uh, experiences of discomfort or whatever imbalance coming up, and we see it as things happening in the physical world, which we then try and mentally interpret, and we even try and change the mental way we think about it. But actually, what, what I discovered was that in the first seven years of my life, the experiences impacted my emotional body and created or, or set a way that my emotional body runs. And it runs in that pattern ongoing. And that pattern was then implanted into my mental body between 7 and 14, and then between 14 and 21 into my physical experience. And then it, it repeats ongoing over and over to the point that many of us say, I don't know why this keeps happening to me. I don't know why this keeps happening to me. And what I discovered... In the same seven-year cycles? Is that what you're well, well, from 21 years old, the seven-year cycle, that is, it's first embedded. It's like someone says, you know, I'm having my bad karma, or it's good karma. Where is this karma that we talk about actually implanted? Well, it is, it's implanted like a software program. Whatever happens to us in the first seven years of our life determines how our emotional body functions. And that first seven years is then repeated in the next seven years of our life through mental activity where we are taught uh, uh, um, storytelling almost. We turn these energetic experiences into stories, or what I prefer to call them spells, because we learn to spell words. And so um, we turn them into, we say, I have fear, anger, grief. When a child is up in the first seven years of its life, it's not having fear, anger, and grief. It doesn't even it use doesn't it. Define it doesn't define it. It doesn't define it. It becomes defined in those next seven years. Mm -hmm. And then from seven to, to, to 21 onwards, it becomes more physical circumstances happening to me that I see the fear, anger, and grief in the world around me. And from that point on, it's 21. That's why we have a big party at 21, because we've arrived. We've integrated something into our emotional, then mental, then physical body. And then that experience will continue every seven years over and over in our experience. And traditionally, the first time we'd really become aware of it would be what we call a midlife crisis. And a midlife crisis is when that emotional condition would break through into our awareness. And that's why a person having a midlife crisis often acts like a child. Because what's happening is they're acting out something that was implanted during childhood. But what's happening in our world at the moment is that we've entered emotional body awareness as a planet. Um, and so we're actually in midlife crisis right now. We're actually in a crisis where the condition, the emotional condition of us as humanity is coming up into our awareness. And there's two ways that we are, are relating to this. The, the, the human beings that know that the heart is the causal point of the quality of the experience are, whether they, whether they have the vocabulary to say that to themselves or not, what they're doing is they're taking responsibility for their life experience and go, I'm responsible for the quality of my experience. I'm responsible for how I feel about things. Right? I'm taking responsibility. And so what they're doing is they are transforming what's coming up to be cleansed. The human beings that are not yet at that emotional or that heart level of awareness are still per perceiving the world happening to them and therefore going out and attacking the world. And, and attacking the projections of their own stuff in the world. So, for example, uh, what's going on in Iraq is a memory. What's going on in the Middle East at the moment, it's a memory. What's even going on in Pakistan at the moment, these are memories. These are ancient memories coming up, but if we don't see them coming through us, we see them as happening to us. These are opportunities for us to process this, the, the fear, anger, and grief, that's what these memories are, to process them, or otherwise to project them out in the world and and if we project them out in the world, either we go into the heart or we run into the traffic. So at this point in our experience, it's, it's really about um, uh, uh, doing the heart work, going. Um, there was someone who once said, unless you become a child again, you don't enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, unless I go and take a look. A f fairly well-known figure. Well, well, well-known uh, figure, right? Someone once yeah. said that. And, 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 that, and that person also said, blessed are those who mourn, right. Right. right? In other words, if you don't take care of your grief, you're not going to, you know, that's the blessing. 
So really the, the task for anyone who begins to um, uh, take responsibility for the experience is to say, what's going on with me in my own heart? And when we ask that question, it's going to lead us back to our childhood. And by going back to that child part of ourselves and taking care of that, we then become our own parent. And as we become our own parent, we stop projecting our need and wanting this into the world. And that's how we grow up. But it's, it's also, it's actually also more profound than that. In, um, in that our fear, anger and grief, which is implanted within our experience in the first seven years of life. What I discovered in my own experience is that the rage that I, that I was experiencing that, that went into a thought pattern about myself and the world I'm in, and then manifested as extreme physical pain, that rage had nothing to do with now. Nothing to do with now. Nothing to do with now. It was, it was a rage that happened to a six-year-old whose, whose, whose father committed suicide, whose mother then went into a state of having a broken heart. It was rage and grief to do with that period. And in fact, it had nothing to do with then either, because it had to do with the father and mother's childhood that had been brought, and their parents' childhood, and it's been going on for generations and generations and generations. And, and what each generation does is it, it imprints into the emotional body of the next generation this ongoing pattern, which is a dysfunctional definition of what love is. And so if one begins to take responsibility for one's experience, it's about going in and looking at one's own dysfunctional definition of what love is and freeing, those, freeing oneself up from that. And the only way to free oneself up from that is to stop saying, the, it stops here with me. I know that my mother and father went through stuff in their childhood and they did the best they passed on to me, but it actually stops with me. I take responsibility for the condition of my emotional body and I clear that in myself. And the profound thing is, when I have the courage to face my own fear and my own anger and my own grief, the feeling of my own fear, when I start to allow myself to feel my fear and not to try and push it away or say it's not supposed to be here, what I've discovered is that the guardians of heaven who stand at the doorway of heaven are called fear, anger and grief. And only those who are willing to face the fear, anger and grief in their own hearts, because to face your own fear, anger and grief without projecting it onto the world requires you to become very brave and also responsible for the experience. And the keys to the kingdom are only given to those that are responsible. And, and it works, what I discovered is it works like this. In feeling my own fear, I, I, by sitting and feeling my fear, not projecting it into the world, and just sitting with it, awoken a vast capacity of my ability to feel that had been shut down. And feeling my own anger, and anger is a very challenging one, but feeling it without going into the story, because anger tells the best stories in the world, without going into the story, without acting out those stories, but holding in that, 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 that anger within, not suppressing or sedating it, but containing it. It creates a buildup of heat and energy in the system, and that energy awakens the feeling capacity. And, and feeling my own grief also, blessed are those who mourn, going and feeling the grief, and when you really get into the grief, you go, it's not even my grief, it's just grief. It's our grief, but feeling that aw awakens my capacity to feel. And once this capacity to feel awakens, then there's a pr profound realization that starts coming in. And this is the realization that everything that we're looking for is already here. So we're, we're looking for peace. Peace is already here. We're looking for love. Love is already here. Uh, we're trying to make peace in this world. Right, which is a person only tries to make peace if they're suffering from a perceptual error. Peace was created. You can't make something that's already created. You can either realize it, perceive it, or you can't perceive it. And so if you watch how our leaders operate, our leaders are our leaders because they reflect us so beautifully, right? So that's why they're our leaders. And so if you watch how our leaders operate when they, when they attempt to establish peace, it shows this person crawling around in the street lamp outside trying to find something that was lost. Our leaders behave like this. If they want to, there's two ways that we go about making peace. You shut up and you sit still so that I can be at peace. And if you don't shut up and sit still, I'll send someone in to shut you up and sit you still so that I can be at peace, right? 
And that comes out of a perception that peace is a physical arrangement. But peace has never come out on this planet from making a physical arrangement. Another way that we make peace is, you bring your manifesto for peace, and I'll bring my manifesto for peace. And we'll sit and, and to a point that we can agree on one manifesto, and then we'll sign it in front of the media, and there shall be peace. But actually, peace has never come about through agreement, because peace is not a mental concept. Peace is a vibration. And a vibration has to be felt. We're only at peace if we feel at peace. That's, that, then we realize peace by feeling it. If our heart center or our emotional body is shut down, if we are not aware of the feeling capacity of our being, then we're going to go and look for peace as a mental concept or as a physical circumstance. So where we are in humanity at the moment is we're moving as humanity. As we enter this world, we move along this pathway of awareness from childhood to adulthood, uh, from emotional, vibrational in the womb, we can call it, through emotional of childhood, the mental years of teenagers, that's why I said, you know, teenagers are mental. Yeah, they are mental, they've been institutionalized, right? And then into the physical experience of the adult, it's from emotional, vibrational, emotional, mental, physical. The journey humanity is on, is on to full awareness, and a journey of evolution. And the journey of evolution reverses that pathway. It goes from physical, to mental, to emotional. We don't have to make the vibrational happen. We don't have to make peace happen. We don't have to make a spiritual experience. The, the, the only thing that is true is that this is a spiritual experience. What we have to do is become vulnerable to realizing it. And we can see how human evolution begins in a very physical place, which we can think of living in the cave and fighting for food and survival and water. It's very physical. And that goes on for a very long period of time. And then we enter a mental, which we've just been. We went completely mental, right? which peaked in the year 1999, which was the end of our mental development. We do not have to do any more mental development. And now what we've done is we've entered the heart, the heart part of our journey, which is a very challenging when we're mental. We've entered the emotional body awareness part of our journey. And that was, it, it began in 1999, but we were, it was activated on a planetary level because when one goes through the emotional body and cleanses it, one goes from fear to anger to grief. Blessed are those who mourn, and then we awaken from that place. Our perceptual, felt perception awakens from that place. And we can see we went, as a planet, we went from fear, anger, and grief. We went 9-11, fear, we even call it the war of terror, fear. And then we went into anger, which is the Iraq war, the, the, the Middle East war going on, and then grief, the tsunami. Those three events happened one after the other, and Everyone was in those buildings, everyone is in that war, and everyone was hit by that wave. And now the, the, now the choice is, am I going to process what that has brought up within my emotional being? Or am I going to project it on the world? Am I going to take it out on others? Or am I going to process it? And if I process it, what happens is I move forward in my evolution, I, I awaken my feeling capacities, I re-enter felt perception. And felt perception is where is the step of humanity that we're in at the moment where let's let's take a break okay. now i think and then yeah. we'll, we'll okay we'll take, okay we'll we'll take right. okay so <laughs> the second video is a really incredible piece it's let it be me so, and this is performed by bonnie wren uh, a great friend of bridging uh, just a beautiful singer a beautiful being the song was written by uh, gilbert B Pavo, uh, Man Curtis, and Pierre Delaney. So it's uh, Let It Be Me, Bonnie Wren. And when we'll come back, we have more art and we'll have more Michael. Enjoy. I bless the day I found you. I want my art around you. And so I beg you. Let it be me Don't take this heaven from one If you must cling to someone Now and forever Let it be me Each time we meet love I find complete love without your sweet love 
what would life be? So never leave me lonely. Tell me you love me only, and that you'll always let it. Each time we meet, love, I find incomplete love. Without your sweet love, what would life be? Oh, so never leave me lonely. Tell me. Welcome back. That was beautiful, wasn't it? Yeah, thank you, Bonnie, for sending it to us. And the picture you're seeing in between is a little small, but hopefully the cameras are picking up is Lauren Curtis, Bridge Between Heaven and Earth, another extraordinary manifestation of humans expressing love, expressing the bridge between heaven and earth. So we're back with Michael. So we were talking earlier about you know, the process, the seven-year processes, and then you get, in a sense, to adulthood, and you graduate, and at 21, you could drink, you go to war. You know, all this stuff, yeah. you're, you're a grown-up now. You know, you can do all this stuff. And then we were talking a little bit about unwinding that process, right. to get back into the child, to get right. back into the, the purity of heart. Right. Why don't you talk a little about that? The, 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 what the presence process does is it enables us to reverse our journey along that pathway of awareness, to first get into the body physically because very few of us live in the body. Um, the, the body tags around wherever we go, but actually we, wherever we think, there we are. <laughs> we, we kind of, I can think now about my brother in South Africa and be there. And so um, a lot of us live in our mental. So the first thing to do is to get in the body physically and then to gain mental clarity about what the causal point of our experience is. And, and in the presence process we use perceptual tools and and experience, giving the person a chance to enter an experience to see that that is so. Uh, and, and once you see that that is so, or you, uh, you, you get that, then you'll go directly to the emotional work. So let's um, uh, ground this in, in practicality for people. Um, normally, for example, say I go to work and I walk into work and my boss looks at me funny and I'm five minutes late, right? And uh, the way that he looks at me makes me really angry. So I get angry and I go to my office. And as I was saying earlier, anger tells the best stories, right? So in my head, I tell you wouldn't be more apt to be fearful losing a job, well, I, I, mortgages. I kids. may, I may be, I may be angry. I may be afraid. I may be, but I'm, I'm upset. Same. I'm yeah, upset. Right. Okay. I walk in. Right. He looks at me right. funny, and I'm late. I get upset by right. the way he looks at me. I tell myself a story, whatever. Now, normally, what we do is when we get upset we behave physically or mentally because we perceive that it's the physical world happening to us or that the story that we tell ourselves if we can change the story or, or, or believe the story that we can so physically I can behave I can go into my, my, my boss's office and go you know I've had it with you I'm tired of you looking at me that way uh, here's my resignation I'm finding another job right and what happens I'll feel kind of good about that because I will change my physical circumstances and whenever we change our physical circumstances very quickly we kind of get a high and think something's happened but a week later I'll go oh what did I do I don't have a job I feel 
you know, suddenly I'll regain. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I myself, exactly, I right? I felt like right. a big shot for about a week. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right? So the physical never accomplishes anything, although it appears to, right? I can also do it mentally. I can go into my boss's office and go, I need to have a talk with you. And now when anyone comes to you and says, I need to have a talk, you know that they're in a state of complete delusion, right? right. Because And that's one of the last <laughs> places you want to be. Right. So I might go... Can I explain <laughs> So I, I have a talk, right, and so I don't want you looking at me like that anymore, and of course you'll go, I don't know what you're talking about, right, because maybe my boss is just constipated, right, and as I walk yeah, through his, a bad yeah, morning. Yeah, right. I, I walk right. through his office and he's going, right, because he's actually just constipated, and, and constipation is a great word because it means can't stop hating, right, can't stop hating, constipation is caused by a lot of rage, so maybe he's got his own stuff going on in his, so, so acting on it physically or mentally never accomplishes anything, right? I end, end up back in the same place where if I walk past his office again and I see his, him look like that, I will, I will be upset again. Yeah, nothing's been learned. N nothing's been learned, nothing's been transformed, right. a lot has happened, right? <laughs> no, a lot of energy, a lot of time, yeah. and, right. All right, a lot of doing. time and attention. A lot of doing, but no undoing, right. right? But if someone brings to my attention that whenever I'm upset, that I'm having a memory surfacing, it's always a memory. And that the memory... That something's being triggered. Exactly. But it's a memory that's being triggered. A memory. And the memory isn't the physical circumstance happening around me. Or the story I tell myself about it. The memory is actually the emotional signature underlying the experience of being upset. Right? So when I walk past his office... So you would say we have a root experience of being upset as yeah. a human being? We have a... We have, uh, we have a, our memory... Our, our emotional imprinting, underlying all our upsetting experiences, underlying all our discomforts, underlying all our physical dis-ease, whether it's a broken relationship, uh, not uh, having a problem in my job, uh, even uh, physical symptoms, underlying all of those, there's an emotional signature. The, the, the challenge we have is that when our emotional body awareness shuts down between the ages of 7 and 14, we become perceptually blind as far as felt perception. We, we can't, uh, only when, I, when you bring it to someone's attention, if, they're, if someone's angry, they go, oh, I'm angry about that, and you go, you're angry. No, I'm not, I'm just, that, that's happening, right? But if you bring it to someone's attention to the emotional component of the experience, there's always an emotional signature underlying any upsetting event, any state. Is it always the same one? No. No, no, it's, it's not. either fear, anger, and grief, or a salad, a combination of those. But fear, anger, and grief are the three primary dysfunctional emotions in the emotional body. In, uh, but is there one fear signature, one... No, no, no there's many levels no. and layers of it. No. Remember, we're going through, as a child, we're going through seven years of imprinting experience. And this imprinting is coming from generations. So there's many layers of it. But, but basically, if you alert that person in the office who's, who's getting upset, that what's happening is they're having a memory, they're, they're experiencing a resurfacing of an emotional signature that was implanted during childhood in their experience with one of their parents, either with their parents towards each other or their parents towards them. And you tell them instead, instead of going to your boss and handing in your resignation, instead of going and having that conversation, that talk, why don't you go home and sit with that feeling? And just sit, say if it's anger that you're feeling, why don't you go home and just sit with the anger? And don't try and fix it, don't try and turn it into balls of light, don't try and do anything with it, don't try and push it away. Just be with it as you would with a child that was angry, right? Because the way we, we've been brought up is that if a child is angry, we say, don't be angry, have a sweet, go play outside. We stop the, the movement of the anger, and the, the part of the child's awareness that's hooked into that anger will never go and play again, and that sweet will become all sorts of other things in its mouth, right? So we don't want to do that to our own anger. We want to just be with our anger. If you be with an angry child, its anger will peak, will go to tears, it will go to a state of peace, and then it will automatically go and play without having anything stuck in its mouth. It's the same with us. If I sit with my anger instead of going into the stories or projecting it out and out of behavior, that anger will build and build and build to a point that I feel like I'm dying. And I will, if I place my attention on where it is in the body, it'll actually move up in my body to a point that will actually shift out of my body and it may even take me to a point of tears. Tears are a sign of energy and motion, emotion. After those tears or whatever that experience I go through, there will be an opening. I'll feel this 
as if something has been released or let, 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 uh, that I've let go of something. Once I've gone through that experience related to that incident with my boss, I will then go to work, I will look at him, I won't have that same encounter with him. Because what, what was happening initially with my boss is I wasn't seeing my boss. I was probably seeing my father. In other words, if I look at you and I see my father, I can no longer see you. Right? I've now entered an illusion. If I then start behaving around you the way I behave around my boss, I'm now behaving in a deluded way. Most of us, whenever we are upset, we're in that state. We've seen an illusion. We've turned this moment into an illusion. We've placed the past over it. And then we're behaving in, 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 a, in an inauthentic manner around that. When I clear that emotional signature related to that particular instance in my life, and I come back, it won't be reflected off my my boss anymore, I will now see him and won't have this ongoing experience. I will neutralize that experience with him by doing something within myself. In other words, the principle of alchemy, of divine alchemy, is I do unto myself as I would have others do. And there is no exception to the rule that everything about the world that upsets me is a reflection of an integrated emotional circumstance within myself. I, in my own journey, I found no exception to that rule. If something out there makes me afraid, it is reflecting a fear within me that's unintegrated that I'm now seeing happening to me instead of actually what's really going on is happening through me. If I am angry, it's, it's related to uh, anger within me that is, that is uh, unintegrated. So in, in a present moment situation, you would never have fear? Well, in the present moment, there is no fear. There's no fear now. Here, in this moment, it doesn't exist. But we can bring it in here anytime we want, right? All you have to do is say something to me the way that my father did that made me upset. And it will trigger the, the fear. And Unless like, you've. Unless I've cleared that. If yeah. I've cleared that, it's like you can't make a person angry if they have no anger within them. Not just laugh. <laughs> you, can't, you can't make a person afraid if they have no fear within them, right? So our task is. That's why, for me, liberation is emotional. It's not physical or mental. Uh, most of our positive thinking is done out of a reaction to a negative circumstance. So it's not about, we can go around all, our, all we want saying, I'm abundant, I'm abundant, I'm the king of abundance, my middle name is abundant, and all that. But it doesn't change anything because abundance or not having any money has got nothing to do with the physical or the mental. It's got to do with energy within my emotional body that's no longer moving. Right? So what is the emotional signature underlying my state of lack? What is the fear underlying that? I need to go and take a look at that. That fear is manifesting as thought processes and as physical circumstances of lack. So there is no exception to the rule that wherever we are imbalanced, if I have a broken relationship, if I have cancer, if I have trouble in my work situation, underlying it is always an emotional signature. All I have to do is stop telling the story stop projecting the behavior out into the world, trying to fix it by doing physical things, and come back into it and sit with myself and go, what am I feeling underneath here? And don't focus on that feeling. It doesn't mean we don't do physical things or mental things, but if we go around only doing physical and mental things, we're sedating and controlling the emotional signature. Once we are aware of the emotional signature and are working with that, we can do mental things. We can look at our thinking and, and our physical behavior. But, but as, as a response to something that's going on in the emotional body. And, and once, I, once I allow myself to feel that fear, anger, and grief, and open my emotional body, in other words, that fear, anger, and grief are blockages in the emotional body. Once I open those, the vibrational experience, which we can also use the word spiritual, but I like the word vibrational because the religions haven't got hold of it yet. The vibrational experience is one that's happening all the time. But when I have fear, anger, and grief, I can't perceive it. So the opportunity being offered to us now is to, is, to, is to integrate what's going on in the emotional body so we can enter felt perception. So you say we're having this opportunity now that wasn't available before? Uh, we're having it now. In, 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 uh, the, the indigenous elders will tell you that of 1999, we entered the emotional body. In whatever vocabulary they use, they will say, we've entered a 13-year period of emotional body cleansing. And that emotional body cleansing is to awaken felt perception. And felt perception 
is a perception we don't use. Children do use it, they have access to it, but it's shut down between 7 and 14 for almost every adult in this world because it's very difficult to function as an adult in this world the way the world has been with felt perception. Felt perception is the, is the ability to feel the consequences of my thoughts, words and deeds before I even put them into play. So if I want to hurt you, I'm going to feel hurt immediately. There's a saying, where there is love, there is no law. In other words, when the heart is functioning, when I have felt perception, yeah, need no one needs to tell me how to behave. Right. My heart governs that, right? right. And that's... Yeah, your love and emotion. Exactly. And so that's... that's um, there's a lot of, of, of... When we come out of the mental era, we, we, we may perceive uh, more conspiracy thinking that we have been shut down. No, we're only just opening up. And, and we're only now becoming vulnerable to emotional body awareness. And once we liberate our emotional bodies and open up our felt perception, then the invitation there is, is to be able to feel, through the feeling body, to perceive the vibrational while we're in the physical, to be in the world but not of it. And once we are functioning from that place, that's a very different type, a very different way of being, not doing, but being in this world. Well, if we're if we're being a different way, we will do a different way. Exactly. The doing will come out of a state of being instead of trying to find a state of being or, or sedate and control and right. uncomfortable. And that's what bridges heaven and earth. Because heaven is here. I mean, even that great teacher we're talking about said heaven is now at hand. Didn't say wait until you die, give some money, right, do, a, do a lot of good things to people and one day you may get into heaven. Saying heaven is now at hand. But heaven unless you become a child again, unless we go and look at that initial imprinting. And that imprinting is what the religions have called sin. It's passed from father to child, from father to mother to child. It's passed from generation to generation. And what's totally profound about living now in this, uh, this, this stage of evolution we're in is we have not only the awareness but the capacity to neutralize that imprinting. And, that and why why wasn't that available before? Because we because we've been moving along the pathway of awareness. We've gone through the through the physical development. We've developed our vehicle. It's developed now. So you're saying there was a destiny to this, and there was almost Absolutely. like a, a plan. This is a garden, and there's a harvest, and and so in the garden, there's first this physical development that we happen. We developed a vehicle. We spent a long time developing this vehicle. It's done. This vehicle is finished. It's really good. People want to make time machines. Don't worry. About, this is the time machine, right? Develop this vehicle. This vehicle is developed. Then we develop the navigation system, the mental body. The mental body is a profound navigation system. We can put our attention on anything faster than the speed of light. It's not meant for thinking. Thinking is a dysfunction of the mental body. We either know something or we don't. Thinking doesn't help us. Have you seen that statue of the thinker? Right. He's still sitting there, right? right. Nothing happened. With a headache. <laughs> exactly. So it's not about thinking, right? Uh, uh, we used thinking and all these things and, and analysis as a means to develop our mental body. But our mental body is a point, is a navigation system, and our emotional body is the fuel. Because real movement is when we, we make emotional movement. We can go all around this world running away from ourselves, but wherever we go, there we are. But we can stand still in one place and face our emotions and let that blocked energy move, and the world around us will transform. We'll accomplish more movement by undoing than by all the things we do. The real movement comes out of the emotional body. So we have a vehicle, we have the navigation system, and we have the fuel. Where do we want to go? We want to yeah. take off. Right, right, right. We want, to, we want to enter vibrational. We want to move ourselves into vibrational awareness while we're in the physical, because that's the best game in town, right? It's the only game. It's the only game in town, right? That bridges heaven and earth. And that's the invitation available to us now in humanity. And it's been available to different civilizations along the way. Like, it was available to the Aztecs, and they left us clues, because they accomplished it. They were gone, right? It was available to the Egyptians, they accomplished it. They were gone. Available to many different civilizations. The difference now, it's available to the whole planet, not we're just we're a... We're going for it. All right. We're yeah. going for it. I think we're going to the end <laughs> of this particular <laughs> incarnation of it. So, if you want any information, call me, Alan, 805-687-2053, about the art, the art projects, Michael, you know, we're available, and it's really, it's an opportunity for us all. We all know it. We all can feel it. Uh, there are a lot of spokes on the wheel. Pick one, find the center, find the heart, and 
You know, the opportunity is there for us all. So, good night. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Come again. Good night.